you have found your way to the open classroom, which this semester has been focused on uh, ways of ethically engaging uh, communities in policymaking. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to our uh, presenters for this evening. Uh, Rebecca Riccio will start us off and then we'll move to uh, Professor Moira Zellner. Uh, Rebecca, you're on. Thank you, Ted. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Open Classroom. If you have been joining us all along this semester, you know we have been focusing on techniques for bringing a racial and social justice lens to the work of community engagement that universities often do, whether that's in teaching or research or other forms of engagement. And I am really delighted to be featuring tonight one of our colleagues, Moira Zellner, who is such a thought leader in the space of participatory modeling. And uh, this is kind of a, a ribbon cutting ceremony actually for us uh, to be a part of the launch of um, a new platform that she and colleagues have developed to make it easily accessible and affordable for community organizations to do participatory modeling on the issues that matter to them. Um, and Maria has been uh, focusing specifically on climate change, but I think that the values and practices of participatory modeling as a way to help communities understand what choices they are facing and that there are trade-offs when we make decisions about how to allocate um, public resources to issues facing communities. And um, that, that is not at all limited to just the area of, of climate change, although it is a place where increasingly we need to make sure that communities have a voice. So I'm just going to tee us up a little bit by saying um, one of the amazing things about colleagues who are in the participatory modeling space is how much they value community voice. And so as you're listening tonight, um, please just keep your antennae up to questions that you can bring to Moira and to our conversation at the end of this about ways you could imagine this kind of approach being used in your own community in relation to issues that your community is facing and, and provide the kind of feedback that I can assure you Moira and her colleagues will take very much to heart as they think about this as an evolving project, as something that based on the very purpose it represents has to be ongoing and participatory in the way it's conceptualized and implemented. And so we will be especially attentive tonight to questions that are coming up, to feedback, to suggestions, to ideas. We'll kind of crowdsource this feedback um, and, uh, and be, rest, be assured that it will manifest itself in future iterations of this work. And with that, Moira, I'm gonna hand things over to you uh, to, to lead us into the world of, of this amazing thing that you and your colleagues have created. Thank you, Rebecca, so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, uh, you know, I, I really am excited to be here. Uh, thank you for giving me the space once again uh, in this series. Um, I am very excited to introduce everyone to uh, For AI. Uh, let me start sharing the screen so that you can, um, so I can share this with you. So uh, can you all see this in, in presenter? Okay. Um, so I'm, what I'm introducing today is uh, this new participatory modeling platform that allows groups of stakeholders and decision makers to collaborate for climate and social impact. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, chairing a session, a panel on participatory modeling. Uh, there's a recording that, that you can find through the website uh, if you were not able to make it then. And there we introduced this concept of uh, and practice of participatory modeling as a, a, a purposeful collaborative learning process through modeling to advance knowledge and solution building. And so Fora AI is an outgrowth of the work that I've been doing uh, with, with colleagues uh, across different uh, institutions over the last 10 years or so. And in this picture, what you see here is uh, uh, the, the setup that we had, that we built over the, the last uh, 10 years uh, for in-person collaborative work, combining simulations like computational simulations with board-like games uh, uh, that 
allow people to come together and create interventions and plans for their neighborhood. And this particular setup, uh, we actually got the um, American Planning Association Academic Tech Innovator Award, the first award that was, uh, that was given uh, a few years ago for, for this setup. And so what we're trying to do, what we've been trying to do at Northeastern is to transfer this experience online. Um, so uh, 4AI evolved from a partnership led by Northeastern's College of Social Sciences and Humanities and uh, our School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs with other units and institutions uh, that are uh, you know, represented here on the slide, um, and uh, which is based on this past work to support and scale up uh, this experience, a collaborative planning experience for complex problems. And so this is particularly well suited for complex problems like climate change and social and economic justice. And what I mean by complex here is that there are many interacting factors and actors that create the problem and that also uh, essentially ha have uh, are involved through direct and indirect impacts with, with the problem. And so that complexity uh, makes it hard to see what are those connections and therefore what do we need to do in order to address these, these problems. So this is where participatory modeling comes in to, to help out. So the way that we uh, essentially create this setup is, uh, and what the platform does to that expands or builds on that setup that we developed. Uh, it supports this kind of collaboration by allowing users to set their priorities. So as they define the, the problem uh, around which they're gonna work together, they're also defining what do they prioritize? And this can be different for different people. Uh, then they collaborate, they work together to co-design uh, different solutions with other people. And then those solutions are tested through simulations. And then those simulations give different kinds of results on the things that we're interested in, the, the, the factors, the variables that we're interested in. And so people can use that information to deliberate about uh, uh, the trade-offs that emerge from each solution, the cost and benefits, which are going to be different for, for different people. So this deliberation then feeds into this iterative process uh, uh, because it feeds back into the possibility of like learning from that and then going back to the drawing board to come up with different solutions, but also maybe as they understand each other and how their values might be different or, and, or their perspectives might be different, they might also question their own values and redefine those or reshuffle those or even go back to the drawing board even for the problem definition and think of the problem differently. Um, but the idea is that uh, that with this understanding of both the biophysical process of like you know whatever situation they're 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 dealing with, uh, um, uh, and uh, with the understanding of each other, they can work to influence outcomes of interest, and they can also understand how to address these inevitable uh, trade offs. So thinking of what do we give up, and what do we do about it. So the process starts with defining the area of concern for a particular problem. So in this case, we're gonna look at two things throughout the presentation, heat, extreme heat, and also urban flooding. Um, and so um, we can define the area, and that's something that uh, can be different for different people. So how do we define the boundaries of a problem? How do we define the boundaries of a community? different, uh, uh, again, this may be different for different problems and groups of people. So right now, our team, we do it for, uh, for a community uh, and with a community. Um, and so we get the data that is needed. But ultimately, what we are building uh, the platform to do is to automate part of this process so that people can do it for themselves. Uh, groups of people can do it for, for themselves and define those boundaries for themselves. Um, the, the, the next step of this is for each participant to have a chance to define their priorities. And so they do this by ranking. So these are different. So for example, for the case of flooding, um, the variables or the outputs or the impacts that they care about might be you know, something like about how much water is infiltrated, how much of the area is flooded, how much does it cost to put green infrastructure in there? 
how much is a, is a property damage for flooding? And so they might have different priorities and rank these things differently. So you can drag and drop and create that ranking. But in addition to that, you can also determine and give a weight, a value, a specific value for these different uh, for these different weights. And then not only can you do that for yourself, you can also look at what other people value and how they value things differently. Uh, so this is what uh, we show here in this uh, in this scenario. Why is this important? Because public officials, for example, might prioritize. Uh, you know, keeping costs down, keeping investment costs down, because there's a limited budget. But hydrologists and engineers might focus on like, I just want to get all the flooding eliminated, right, or addressed, and, but that can cost a lot of money. And then some areas might still get flooded. And so for a resident living in an area that is still flooded, you know, they don't care. It's like, you're making me maybe contribute to the payment of, of, of infrastructure for uh, to address flooding, which it might address it in a large part of our community, but it doesn't address it for me. And so this is why it's important to, to see what the different priorities uh, might be, to know where we stand and where other people stand. And this is also especially useful for facilitators because facilitators can see what people care about and guide then the conversation towards more constructive outcomes, knowing where they stand with these priorities. Um, here, the, the, the key aspect of, or the, the, the center, the core of this platform is this interactive whiteboard. Uh, oh, sorry, before, before I, I, I talk about that, let, let me talk about how we, you, we are also building in the capability uh, to uh, invite different kinds of users. So there are owners of, of the projects, there are facilitators, there are participants, and you can invite uh, different, uh, different actors into a project to be part of this and, and work together. And now it's where, like, what are they working on? It's this uh, interactive whiteboard that now I can, I can show. This is a key feature of our platform. So before, if you remember the picture at the beginning, it was actually kind of like a paper map and with wooden tokens on it with different colors of, you know, showing different kinds of interventions on the, on, on the map. Here we're, do it, we're doing that online. And so participants work together to design solutions by placing intervention tokens on the community map. In this illustration, they are placing green infrastructure elements to address neighborhood flooding. They also have the ability to comment ask questions, flag things, get more detailed information about the intervention. So for example, what is their cost? What is their function, their capacity to capture water, et cetera. Or about the place, they can, they can look for information about the place through the layers of the, of the data, like say elevation or land cover and things like that. Um, so then after they're able to work on this interactive board together to co-design solutions for, in this case, for green infrastructure together, then once they say like, okay, are we done with a particular plan? Let's go ahead and say like, okay, let's, let's run a simulation to see how that plan plays out. And so this is then where the simulation that which runs very fast in a, in a few minutes, can give an, a sense of where the areas of higher impact are. They can be quickly identified and viewed in different perspectives over time. And I'll tell you in a little bit why that is important. So what we, what we did for this presentation in particular, we wanted to try a stylized representation of the mass and cast area. And this doesn't quite fit with what you would see on, on a map, but we were trying to capture like the main features of this area. Uh, where there are competing concerns. Um, so here we've got a lack of green space. There's susceptibility to both flooding and extreme heat. There are strong gentrification pressures and there's also homelessness. So we've got to think of like, again, like the trade-offs, if we wanna put something in here, uh, like green infrastructure, well, it will take room to do other things or it will increase gentrification pressures or it will do other things that could be both positive and, and negative. So if we wanted to think of, um, uh, you know, what green infrastructure could do for, for this area, so people could try to work together to address some of these, these concerns, 
And so here, for example, what, what the platform would allow you to do is to locate, so here you've got green infrastructure uh, uh, on, on the edges of the blocks, and you've got uh, permeable pavers. So these would be trees, uh, roof gardens, permeable pavers, and so on. And so what the platform is doing here is just showing you, you have the capability of moving this around and seeing it in three dimensions because that can become important. Uh, and, and also just oriented in a way that whatever is more um, intuitive for people to, to deal with uh, and to uh, assess. Um, and so what I'm gonna show here is a preliminary where we're, we're working on with this uh, simulation model called LGRID, which stands for uh, uh, landscape green infrastructure design model that is something that we developed and to speak to what Rebecca was saying it's running as a simulation kind of like in the background you don't you see the simulation and but you don't see the model itself but that model we actually developed with stakeholders and we developed it with engineers as much as we developed it with stakeholders who needed the model to assess their green infrastructure plans and to understand how they could address some of their flooding issues uh, uh, with, uh, with a green infrastructure. And so we had to make sure that it was relevant. And so we worked with them to create a tool that would be relevant uh, uh, for them and for those purposes, um, as well as something that could run fast, that would capture the complexity, that would capture the engineering concepts as well as the social concepts uh, in the model. And we're extending this, this model now also in consultation with uh, technical uh, stakeholders, but also we, we will be working uh, more with uh, community stakeholders as well, just to make sure, again, to ensure its relevance and its meaningfulness uh, for the purposes of, of uh, supporting decision making. So on the left, this is before any green infrastructure. What it shows is throughout a day, how heat just collects the dark red will be like you know intense heat. And on the right, you can see a simulation with green infrastructure where you have like the roof gardens here. I, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I hope you can. But uh, that where you can see that the green infrastructure is definitely lowering uh, uh, the temperatures in several of the places where they were installed. Of course, not on the parking lot because the permeable pavers will not affect the heat, but yes, definitely the, the vegetated um, uh, uh, green infrastructure will make a difference. I've got problems here with the curse, the, the click forward. Uh, and so if we wanted to check what it would do to flooding, what the same plan would do for, for flooding, we have on the left, a simulation of what it would look without any green infrastructure and on the right, what it would look with green infrastructure. And here's where you can see where the permeable pavers really have an impact. And in reducing the flooding, this is gonna become clear in the next slide. If it lets me click forward, there we go. Um, and, and so here you can see like the, the, the difference in terms of like the area that is, this, that is flooded because a, a lot of it is being captured by uh, the green infra infrastructure. So the point of this is like, it's not just to look at the final result, but why and what we found is that looking at the simulation is important to support understanding of how the flooding and heat uh, work. If we can understand that, then we can plan for how to address them more effectively, knowing what the process is behind, it, behind the accumulation of heat and the accumulation of water. So as an example, in the in-person settings, people would start to understand why water was pooling in certain areas, why it was flowing down the street or particular streets and not others. And so it was very interesting to see like how they would use their hands. So after running several simulations, they would use their hands to say, to anticipate already, they started reasoning in terms of how water flows through the landscape. And they could start using that reasoning to develop their green infrastructure plans. And the plans that they developed were as impactful or as effective as the experts would have uh, advised. So the recommendations that were coming from people who do not necessarily have that background were similar to the ones that experts would, uh, would propose. So that was really exciting to see. Um, so, but, but the issue again is like, even going back to the issue of like different preferences and priorities, again, if people have different priorities, a, a, a green infrastructure might be a uh, plan might be great uh, for the engineer, for example, but it might not be great for the public official who's trying to get funding for something that is very expensive to do. 
right? And so simulations alone are not gonna give us answers or, or results. Uh, uh, so a solution that may be good uh, for some may not be good for others. So what you need at that point is that once a solution is finalized and the simulations runs, then what you need to do is have this evaluation. So here you've got the, the simulation being run and then you filter that the results of that simulation through the priorities of different people. And so you can compare to a baseline, you can compare, I'll, I'll run this again so that you can, and maybe hopefully pause it where um, it's showing the different priorities because I do want to highlight that part. Uh, so if you bear with me for a sec as it comes up, here we go. So let me pause that. So what this is showing is how each person is evaluating that particular scenario according to their priorities. And what the different colors mean here is like, what are the variables? What are the factors, the kinds of impacts that they care about the most? And so that can help the group and especially the facilitator guide the discussion about how, what do we value? Who, who gets affected by this in a positive way? Who gets affected in a less positive way? This kind of like difference, for example, between these bars corresponding to each person is what gives us ideas of trade-offs. And so again, like what are the costs and benefits for different people and why is the, you know, the colors? So what variables make that happen? Why is it very good for Dominic, but not so good for Hironaka, right? And so being able to see that uh, 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 and compare how their valuations differ from others and why and being able to deliberate around those, uh, those trade-offs. So th then also understanding, I'll continue playing this for, for a sec, and understanding then also that relationship with a baseline. So here, this is the results, but it compares it to a baseline of like, how much better are we doing with this solution that we're proposing together? So in the end, the discussion is not about finding the optimal solution, the best solution, but what is a solution that we can all live with? Um, so these are some of the basic features that will be prototyped this summer, uh, uh, but we're also planning for future development to scale up the experience. That's really the, the, the main, uh, goal that we have. So on one hand, uh, we want to um, provide administration support in terms of organization of projects uh, uh, and teams working together. So uh, this is very important as precisely like for scaling up purposes. So I'm not sure why this is not loading up. Hmm, let me try that again. Hmm. Let me just try this one more time. There we go. Oops, no, that's not where I wanted to go, hold on. Let me see. Okay, here we go. Sorry. About that. So on one hand, you can have you can be active in different projects, and maybe especially if you're a facilitator, but also as a participant. Uh, and then within a project, you can have different plan versions, draft plans, and so you can take a look and see also the evolution of these plans uh, as as we move forward in the discussion. Then you know, it's looking and evaluating each one of these plans, each one of these solutions through the concern profile. I don't know why it's doing this to me. I'm sorry, people. I'm sorry. It's just being very glitchy today. It's okay. Don't worry. We have all been there. Uh, there we go again. I'm sorry about that. Let me see if I can just Move this forward. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, it just does not want to work. Okay. So I'll just tell you about it. But essentially, what it allows you to do, like the, the idea is that you can organize things by a project. Then within each project, you can see the plans. And what is important there, as I was trying to say, is that you can follow the evolution of these plans. And that is important to understand the evolution of ideas. We can always go back and see how they evolved, but it also helps us uh, think of like, how do uh, we assess this, this process, right? Like in terms of uh, what happened in the conversation 
and how is it becoming a better a better solution or maybe not but it it allows us to have that information to be able to do that then we can also look at all the different concerns profiles and or like the, actually the evaluation of each one of these solutions through the different concern profiles and the other thing to think about this is there can be participants who are interacting synchronously together at the same time working on these um, on different plans right but there could also be people who maybe cannot for whatever reason meet at a certain time so they meet at a different time so there could be subgroups of people there could also be people who maybe cannot contribute to a plan but they still want to you know have their concerns be voiced so we could have the, those concern profiles represented and so these solutions can be evaluated against the concerns of people who maybe did not contribute to the solution building because they couldn't for whatever reason, but they still want to have a voice, right? Uh, and there's also a, another tab there that unfortunately, again, I cannot show, uh, but that shows the different activities so that you can see what has been going on. Like, have people been working on the solution building? Like, are there new plans that were proposed? Are there, you know, comments or, or, or things that were changed so that you can keep track of the most recent activity? You can also look at the comments that were posted, especially if they were posted to each other. In one of the earlier videos, I showed that example of flagging somebody, hey, can you look into this? Um, so you can see that easily. And then, of course, the aspect of the having different participants and sharing the ability to share uh, that uh, particular project or a particular plan with somebody else, maybe a new key stakeholder that we found out about that really needs to be part of this process and we, we hadn't been in touch yet, and now we can include that person in, in the process. So the other aspect that I, and I hope that this one works because this is the one that I have most fun with, uh, is uh, this aspect of, of uh, providing a game-like experience. Uh, and so what I'm going to show here is that uh, simulations, we're trying to make uh, simulations run fast, but you still have to wait a few minutes. So there are different things that you can do. And so we can ask participants to actually choose to play a game while they're waiting for simulation results. And in this game, we ask them to anticipate like what we plan to do is to anticipate what the outcome of that particular simulation is going to be. So what's the outcome of the plan going to be? Let me run it again. Uh, so you choose to play the game and then you, you know, answer these, these questions and you can change these values. And so what that does is on one hand, it just can provide a way to explain what the reasoning is uh, behind and, and then give them points and actually kind of like do like a friendly competition and, and just to see who, who gets it, who gets closer to, to the outcome and so on. But what is really important and key about this is not only just to make it fun and entertaining for people, but it's really to support the reasoning that we hope to foster with these kinds of tools so that people can engage in understanding complexity and reasoning in terms of complexity, uh, anticipating what effects, uh, what the effects are gonna be, which is helpful to transfer to other kinds of situations and other kinds of problems, in addition to you know, just other kinds of plans and being able to, to, to more flexibly propose then uh, uh, solutions uh, to, to problems. But it also very critically helps with uh, um, the assessment of the tool of all the platform to see like, are people um, being helped by this approach? Are they being helped by the different interfaces? Are they being helped by the modeling tools, by the collaboration? So this allows us to gauge that and then with that information, be able to refine the approach and the tools. Also, critically, it can help facilitators make sense of what is going on, like how are people understanding the problem and how the solutions are panning out and like what, how to deliberate the trade-offs and then support the discussions uh, moving forward as well. So the final feature that we're also thinking of uh, working on is and, and, and implementing that we have prototypes for is the dashboard. And uh, in this dashboard is allows people to have a quick view of different activities and projects and provide the metrics, especially again, that can help facilitators. So these would be 
the different projects that a person is working on and just like the most recent activity comments and so on and so forth. Um, and here, what we're exploring is the possibility, given all the information about what people are thinking about, what they're proposing, this, there's a lot that happens. I mean, even in the in-person workshops, which were with few people, there was a lot happening and the facilitator has a, a very critical role there in trying to synthesize everything that's going on as the conversations are happening. We are hoping that we can create artificial intelligence tools that can help synthesize all of that um, information coming from the interactivity uh, 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 in the platform that then can support facilitators to make sense of everything that's going on and how to, again, support uh, the conversation to, to go, move forward in constructive ways towards solutions that, again, that we can all uh, uh, live with. Um, so in sum, there are two aspects that we want to support, that we're aiming to support, and that this platform is designed to support. The first and most critical one is this inclusive engagement in modeling and collaborative solution building. So in, in, in participatory modeling and collaborative solution building. And because it's through modeling with uh, uh, science-based simulations, then it, it's a way of integrating the policy and, and the social process of solution building together with a scientific and evidence-based reasoning to inform uh, that social process uh, fully so that we can move from mental models and assumptions and, and, and desires and beliefs, but that are actually you know, also supported with uh, more uh, expansive evidence of what would work and how would it work and for whom. Um, so Fora AI then democratizes decision-making, empowering communities uh, and harnessing their innovative capacity to jointly create concrete pathways towards climate resilience and social justice. So really getting on the ground with solutions that will work on the ground, we know then who would benefit and in what ways and who would be more uh, negatively affected and in what ways and what do we do about that, this and engaging in, in, in uh, productive discussions about, about this. Um, so, with that, I, I just want to thank you all for your attention. I'm excited to give this, this uh, preview of, of this um, uh, platform. I wanted to let people know, invite you all to get involved, uh, sign up for updates and give feedback. So again, like the if you go to the website fora.ai, you'll have you know, a, a summary of this. There'll also be a, a, um, this same uh, slide deck will be there uh, for you to see it in, in at your own uh, pace. Uh, but also there's, uh, importantly, there's a, a contact us button that if you can just uh, send us information, uh, we can, uh, you know, just give you updates, let you know when things are, you know, released uh, gradually as we, as we build them. Um, and let us know the kinds of issues that you'd like to work on, uh, where for AI might be helpful, what are you know things that you would like represented? What kinds of models you would like to uh, work with? All of these things we would be totally thrilled uh, to hear about. So with that, I'll, I'll stop sharing. So then we can hopefully have some some discussion uh, coming from this. Um, thank you so much for that, Mara. I am so excited. I have so many questions, but I know where to find you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> resist throwing all my questions out there first. Um, because I know we've got some really good questions that have been um, posted by participants. And so why don't we go to those first? Uh, and then if we have time, uh, we'll dive into some of the things because you know I teach systems thinking to undergrads who are excited about social change. And um, I, there are so many things I, I want to ask you about, like how do we get people to become systems thinkers yeah. um, and, and open up that just new way of looking at the world. But we will pause that 
Uh, and um, I want to get to a couple of really great questions. Uh, and I want to thank Baldwin Hum for a couple of questions. And I think you can see those in the Q&A as well. But I'll, I'll read them. Um, I, I think I'll read both of Baldwin's questions. And then you can, you can grapple with those a little bit uh, in the order that you'd like. So the first one is during the definition phase, defining a boundary or area, is it strictly geographically or spiritual, uh, spatially oriented, or can it be done with other groupings, whether cultural or anything else? I'm thinking in particular of more uh, diasporatic communities and groups. And I, I think there's so many different ways that people define what community means and define ways that they conceptualize the challenges or problems they're facing. So that's a great question. And then the second one, um, are these tools intended to be used by traditionally marginalized groups to help them engage with governments and institutions or are, are they more of a top down tool and and I will I will editorialize a little bit on that question um, because I see the role of the facilitator here as being really critical in framing the question and moving conversations along and so in addition to uh, how it, are, is this intended for people to be working with institutional representatives? And how do we curb the power and influence of the facilitator in what could already be a dynamic which is laden with issues of positionality and power and identity and, and all of that? So, so let, me, let me hand things over to you with those two questions from Baldwin. Thank you. And thank you, Baldwin, for these great questions. So in terms of the first one, it doesn't have to be geographical. Uh, these are geographical because the examples are on aspects that are spatial, but they do not need to be spatial. In fact, uh, there oftentimes uh, we start with a, with a problem that is not spatial, is purely social and networked, right? And so, we use different kinds of representations of that space. It's still a space, but it's not a geographic space, mm -hmm. right? And so we're also working with different kinds of representations of that space that are not geographical, but that we could represent the factors that make the, 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 that particular problem complex. So what are the causal linkages? What are the feedback? So going back to Rebecca's uh, notion of system thinking, and being able to develop. So uh, another tool that I, that I work with, so what I showed you right now were computational models that are process-based, uh, you know, essentially you, you've got process of heat distribution and water distribution and things like that. But there are other kinds of models that, or, that are representations of causal relationships like causal loop diagrams. And I've conducted uh, several workshops with that kind of technique where what you draw is factors affecting each other and you look at how they're connected. Do they change in the same direction? So one goes up and the other one goes up as well, or they go both down together, or do they go in inverse relationship? And, and showing the feedbacks, the feedback mechanisms that again, like obscure the direct and indirect effects, but that when we draw it out together, we have a, collective image of that system. Uh, and it's almost like, and, and you could do that also with networks, um, but all of these are different kinds of representations of complexity that I think are important to have in a tool like this. And we've been thinking of having that support. So it's not just spatial. Um, there are tools that already exist. So what we do not wanna do is we do not want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, some other colleagues have done amazing jobs, uh, an amazing job with those tools, but we want to see how do we integrate that activity into this broader platform because the platform offers these other aspects, which goes to the second question, right, which is the, the aspect of collaboration and really, you know, the flexibility of doing it synchronously, asynchronously, being able to also share your values and filtering the results of whatever simulation in whatever format you're doing it, geographical, spatial or not, um, and, and being able to do that. So that's something that our platform provides that we want to see how we can integrate with exist, existing tools that others have developed. But the idea is definitely our focus is on groups that do not typically, for whatever reason, engage in decision-making because 
they it's not an easy space to enter right it's not an easy space to be part of not everybody is invited to that space what we want to do is create the space for that to happen so it's definitely not intended to be top down but to refer to what uh, rebecca was saying about the facilitator absolutely that's one of the things that i'm happy that it's coming up because even though you know i am a modeler and, and i do all of this kind of work it's not about the modeling. It's not about the tool. It's really about the process, the social process, the relationship building, the solution building, right? And so here, the facilitator is crucial. So you can have the best set of tools in the world. They're going to do nothing for you if you don't have a good facilitation, right? So that's why we focus on the tool, but as it, as it supports facilitation. And there are different kinds of facilitator that you have to keep in mind. So there's the one that maybe helps with the technical aspects of it, like how to operate the models, how to, how to put in the data, how to format the data, you know, things like that. But there's also the, the social facilitator, the facilitator that helps with the dialogue around the tool. And that person ideally would be someone from the community. So one of the things that we want to do is be able to make this make this available to communities and and have sessions where people just get the training if they want to i mean we're not going to impose it but like if they want to be trained as facilitators we would be doing that so that we that that's also part of the scaling up process if we don't have facilitators to to do this kind of work then this is not going to be able to be scaled up right mm -hmm. so part of that is providing the support with the tools but also with the training to do that kind of work, but that that's absolutely critical. And and Moira, in thinking about that, um, you know, resources, access to this technology, et cetera, et cetera, are also something that we need to keep in mind in terms of equitable access. And I'm wondering what what has that looked like, or what do you imagine that look like when when people are gathered with mixed access to technology? with uh, different, you know, I, I love the asynchronous part because that means it's not contingent on people's work schedules or their yeah. childcare or anything like that. Um, but the technology itself is is a barrier. And I know we can't, I, I know we can't address every barrier, but I'm just wondering what what you've, because I'm sure you've talked about that. Yes. Um, <laughs> right, so, so what does that look like? We've thought about this and Atia also brought this up, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, especially in, in, in light of, you know, the, di the digital divide. Yeah. So one of the things that we are working with a wonderful partner uh, called Audentio, uh, they're software developers with whom we've had a, a long relationship. They're very much, uh, um, they're, they're donating part of, of their time as well to do this because they really care, they're, they're socially uh, 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 driven. Um, and so, uh, and I did want to do a shout out for them uh, 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 as well, because they're just wonderful partners. And so they are also developing it, this platform in a way to just make sure that like, we address all of accessibility issues in terms of just websites. But in addition to that, so also like different kinds of devices, so access with different devices, uh, but also thinking of, again, like thinking of the, the possibility of do th doing things asynchronously, that people might not have a computer at their house. They might not have internet connection. So maybe they have to do to go to a public library to do this, or and they have to do it like a, a, a time that they they can, or you know, so so trying to address that. But the other aspect of it is that we're not gonna let go of the in-person part of it either. And so that is something that needs to continue happening as well. And so this could be an entry point, this platform could be an entry point. Or maybe the in-person is an entry point, right? But there's always the, the idea for us, for, for my team, is that we're here as a, a, as a resource to support this kind of work in whatever way makes sense mm -hmm. for the community that we're working with and collaborating with and, and creating things with. That, that opens us really nicely for the next question from, from Madi Taragi. Uh, the two questions, is there any are there computational barriers to the platform? How many actors can be involved? And uh, the second one is how can stakeholders and policymakers define their own projects? Is that something that they can do easily themselves? And I, I had a question about that as well, because um, 
depending on where you sit is how you see the problem. And so what level of expertise is required to make sure that the definition, because this is something about why perspective taking and, and hearing and listening to community is so important. Because if you're not defining the problem initially from the perspective and lived experience of community, then you're gonna be solving to the wrong problem. Um, right. So, so how, how does that, the definition of the problem take place and what level of expertise or non-expertise, uh, is, is, is possible within this? So I think that anything is possible. Um, and I think that it starts even before engaging with the platform, right? So I think that the, I think of the platform as a way to, Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm showing it, I'm, I'm showcasing it here, we're, we're having it accessible, but it's really for people to see what it can do. But then ultimately, again, it's about the people, it's, it's about the human process, right? And that definition of the problem is a completely human process. So that has to be a conversation, an ongoing conversation, an iterative conversation with the community. So again, we're not doing this for, we're doing it with. And so the idea is to engage, this be an enabler of conversations so that we can engage together around the kinds of problems that need to be addressed. What are those problems? How do we see those problems? From my perspective, I can tell you how I see it, but I will not open my mouth until I hear from you first, <laughs> okay? I've got to listen, right? And so I, I'm going to hear and my team is going to hear and like the, the people that we work with, we're going to listen to each other and just un- be guided by the community in terms of like, what, does, what matters here? What is important? What are the issues? What are, what are the needs? What are the assets? What do we aspire to? What are our, you know, like what are our goals? And this is a, the, that's always where we start. Um, and then based on that, then we go on to see like, okay, what, what can different tools and approaches uh, do for us? And it will vary depending on, on that problem. But as I said earlier, it is an iterative pro- process. And as we learn, we might learn that the problem is not what we thought it was and we mm. need to redefine it. So we need to go back to that conversation and, and, and redefine that. Um, so in terms of like what the platform can do, it has to be flexible to allow for that definition of the problem to change, right? And so that's where we have like all of these different drafts and, and the possibility of having like, you know, different uh, concern profiles and, and putting in different variables and things like that, that allow people to then shift that definition of, of the problem as we learn together. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I'm not really responding to Maddie's uh, <laughs> uh, questions, but very quickly, as you saw just simply from a slideshow and that the video doesn't work, there's always gonna be a, <laughs> some kind of, of glitch, right? Uh, but you know, like the idea is to really be able to allow uh, uh, access to a, a large, population of, of, of users. I would have to ask Audentio what that limit is, uh, but hopefully it's very, very high. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and so, well, we did talk about defining the, the projects. So, so yeah. we did cover that, yeah. Um, I, I wanna just follow up with a question about the capacity of the program. And then we've got another great question from Baldwin that we can turn to. And then I'm gonna turn things over to Ted because I'm sure he's got a lot of interesting thoughts percolating in his head around this. Um, We know from the way the world works that there are infinite permutations of these kinds of challenges that people may identify. I'm curious, um, because this is not my space at all, around the simulation process and and how it is. Is is this an AI process? Is, Is the system constantly learning from these simulations? How do you account or are you having to have human interventions as different kinds of of um, problems come up and then the learning starts to happen from there. How how do you account for all of the unpredictable and infinite permutations um, that can can come up in these simulations? So that's an area of work that we're really now starting to explore and, and try to get the funding to really develop that aspect of the work. But ultimately the vision is 
that there will be AI capabilities that can help us make sense uh, of all th this, you know, it's going to be a lot of information that is going to be processed through the platform or that is mm -hmm. going to be, uh, yeah, I would say processed through the platform is the right, is the right way of saying it. But we, data by itself is not going to do anything for us, right? We've got to make sense of it. Um, and it's humans who have to make sense of it. So we cannot entirely offload that to algorithms because there are a whole lot of problems with that, right? Like with biases and we, it's, a, it's another black box. And if it's a black box, what's the point? We're not learning anything. You know, if it doesn't align with my beliefs, I'm not gonna trust it. I mean, th there are all of these issues that go on with that. So it has to be a form of transparent process but at the same time, something that is a prosthetic device for our for our thinking and our processing that can help us because it's it's a lot of information. It's complex inf information. So this is a whole area of exploration that we're trying to develop here at, at Northeastern with with this group and, and other collaborations that I have uh, uh, with with people there. I'm, am I responding to your question? You responded to mine, okay. and I think you actually, you segued right into Baldwin's question, which was um, what kinds of training data will be used for this platform and how is equity built into the fundamentals of both the algorithms and the data they draw from? Are these algorithms able to identify and decipher currently invisible issues, processes, players, or will they need to be predefined? Right, no, so, so, so in line with that, the idea is, again, like, first of all, the models we develop are developed with community. They're meant to be open and clear and simple enough that you can inspect them and question them, and you meaning anybody, okay? Uh, and we've done it that way precisely to address issues of trust, issues of bias, uh, just really making it accessible for people to understand what the model does in order to be able to derive meaning from whatever the model produces, right? Because that's ultimately what we need in order to inform our solution building, right? And yeah. we, see, we see that happen with that kind of model. Now, if we want to also process the social aspect of it, which is how are people reasoning? What are they suggesting? How are they coming up with solutions? What kinds, what's, what's the evolution of solutions and things like that? That's also going to require a set of algorithms that we're probably going to have to develop also with communities mm -hmm. in order for it, for th those sets of algorithms to also be transparent. And they're going to have biases because everything has biases, but at least we're going to be aware of them we're going to know what they are. And so we're going to consider that in whatever comes out of that process of artificial intelligence, right? And so that's the part that is really key here. It's a challenge, right? It's, it's, a, it's a new area of work. And that's what we're, that's what we're embarking on. Yeah. But excited, excited to do that. It's, it's so disruptive in so many interesting ways, but before I, I get into the excitement of disruption, Ted, let me, let me and Moira be quiet for a minute and listen to your thoughts on this and, and whatever profound wisdom and thoughts you're going to bring to, to this conversation, because I'm, I'm sure there's stuff going on in that mind of yours. Well, <laughs> let me just uh, uh, ask a question. Uh, normally, we look at these uh, kinds of platforms and interventions as ways of empowering uh, communities that um, wouldn't ordinarily have a voice in policy making. I want to flip that a little bit. Suppose you had um, an area on Cape Cod and you had a, a group of people uh, who traditionally have opposed things like windmills and al alternative forms of energy. Mm -hmm. How might you use a tool like this uh, to get those kinds of folks uh, to consider some of the uh, better alternatives and more environmentally sensitive alternatives uh, rather than simply uh, holding out and saying they um, don't like the aesthetics of, of windmill blades? So what I would do is again, I would hear them. I would hear the concerns. And I would represent those concerns in the concern profile. So that I, would, I would have them fill out their own concern profile and how they prioritize things.
But remember, there are other variables that are important too, like energy reliability, like you know sea level rise, and all of these things are linked to our sources of energy, right? And so if in the modeling, we can show how these things are linked to each other and how, I don't know, because I can never anticipate what I'm gonna get when I model, right? When I, when I build a model, I don't know, especially with a complex model, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. So when we build these models together, we don't know what the outcomes are gonna be, but let's represent the processes, let's represent the mechanisms. And then let's see what, what comes out of it. Now, sometimes what happens is that when the outcomes are not what people expect or what people want, they're like, there's something wrong with your model, <laughs> right? That's kind of like the, the reaction. But here's the catch. It's not my model, it's our model. We actually built it together. The model has information that you put in, right? So, okay, we can go back to the model and see what needs to change. If there's an error in the model, let's fix it. Okay, let's, let's correct it. But typically what happens is that there isn't really an error. No, it's actually, this is how, how it works. And so then here's where, again, the skilled facilitator is crucial. And the way to set up and design these exercises is crucial because we don't want to discourage people to the point of hopelessness and paralysis or just anger and, and, and just disengage. I, I'm not gonna do this because it's, you know, it, it, it's not right or it's, it's against what I believe. We've, that's part of the design of the exercise of the entire collaborative exercise to make sure that we don't end up you know, with people just being disengaged, discouraged, mm -hmm. either depressed or, or just like numb and not participate again. Uh, but that's not the tool, that's really the process. And so we've got to be very, very mindful of that aspect. I, I have a readiness question brought on by that mm -hmm. because um, one of the things that this tool does is implicitly try to counteract a lot of the habits of mind that all of us have as yeah, people yeah. who have been incubated in a predominantly white capitalist oriented patriarchal system to think certain ways, right? Mm -hmm. And some of, some of it, we're all hardwired to think certain, you know, we have certain uh, responses to stimuli. We have certain ways we have been taught to think. Um, these habits of mind are very difficult to disrupt. Um, things like just taking the big picture, perspective taking, comfort with ambiguity, anticipating unintended consequences and so on and so on and so on. And you're taking them all on with this, right? <laughs> yes. But you're doing that in this gamified or experiential way that doesn't necessarily alert them to the fact that this actually is gonna cause you some cognitive and emotional dissonance Yes, as yes. you participate in this, because you are going to get those consequences. You know, the, the people that Ted described, um, their mental models are, are very powerful for them and, yes, and very yes. deeply entrenched, as are all of our mental models. And I'm, I'm curious if you've thought about a little um, pre-training or any kind of user-friendly introduction to alert you to the idea of what these habits of mind are. And, and we're gonna invite you to engage in perspective taking. We're gonna invite you to bring curiosity and patience. We're gonna invite you to consider the validity of other people's um, perspectives in the public common. Mm -hmm. and, and we're really working towards the, the, the least bad or the, the best we can get to, right? Not optimal, but the one that satisfies most of us. How do you orient people? to that experience before they get on the roller coaster, because I would imagine that not anticipating some of that or knowing that they're in, in for that kind of experience might increase people's dissatisfaction with the experience when it hits them out of the blue. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you brought this up. This is an area of, of, of work that is, all, is, is critical. And as I was saying, is part of like the design of the process itself beyond the, beyond the tool, or as we think of, the use of the tool is inserted in this bigger social process. Mm -hmm. And that aspect is absolutely critical because we do find that, uh, and we have found that, 
that uh, that it will, you know, uh, it, it will be very difficult for people. Uh, and and when they get to that point again, like there there are options, and depending on how you you uh, manage that situation, it can it can just lead to just a sense of, of failure and, and dissatisfaction. And that's not what, what we want, right? So I think that what you propose in terms of the kind of exercise is something that we have done. Uh, sometimes we do it like with icebreaker exercises and this is in person. So we would have to see like, if we wanted to do this online, could we do it? Like, how would we do it? And I think that there would be games that we could do this way, right? So part of the game-like experience would be doing some of these icebreakers where you know you you play a game you think you're gonna get a particular result by doing something but then you get like totally counter counterintuitive results and and then maybe that's that's the way to get people kind of like used to that to that to that notion um as i as i mentioned in my in in, in the panel Two weeks ago, one of the things that I'm that I'm doing in my participatory moral in class is I'm is I'm in, introducing meditation and mindfulness as a practice that definitely we need as practitioners in this in this space. But I, you know, I have to wonder, <laughs> like we ask participants to engage in in mindfulness. Uh, you know, that's that's probably too much to ask. But we, but but it's something that I think is important to. To even cultivate, even if not like, of course, engage in 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 uh, mindfulness and meditation with uh, necessarily with our stakeholders, although you know maybe they want to, um, is to just cultivate that relationship building quality that that brings, uh, and and the aspect of like we're working together, we want to do good stuff together, uh, create that that sense of community. Uh, we're all affected by this. Um, and so let's work together and figure things out together and just using that that or creating that kind of space um, uh, for for everybody's uh, safety, right? It's a challenge. It is a challenge. I don't think that I have everything figured out, that we have everything figured out, but I think that it's good to be mindful about this and keep thinking of ways in which we can introduce it as we design and continue to evolve this, this field and this, this practice and the tools that go with them. Well, we are um, at the end of our hour. This is a, a fascinating and very innovative approach to uh, empowering communities. And um, I think the questions that folks have raised uh, really go to uh, some of the uh, core issues around how this is applied and um, how we really get community folks to uh, engage with this uh, kind of innovative approach. So um, I'm, I'm delighted that, uh, uh, that you presented this tonight and I'm certain uh, that we'll get some additional questions uh, and, and uh, penetrating thoughts um, as a result of this conversation. Rebecca? Do you want to talk about next week? Do I want to talk about next week? Um, yes. And you, you know what? Before I even start doing that, I want to make sure that I get it absolutely right. And I, I don't misstate anything about it. Uh, it's one I'm really excited about. On March 30th, our topic is going to be economic justice, investing in local communities for transformation. Um, we're going to have a really exciting board. Jenny Stevens, the director of the policy school is going to be leading a panel uh, with Nia Evans from the Boston Ujima Project, uh, Jack Payton, who is also from the Ujima Fund and Boston Ujima po Project and Alex Popoli uh, for the Center for Economic Democracy. One of the things we uh, talk about a lot in a community engagement is the notion of equitable distribution of resources uh, and, and needing to understand people's positions and power and who has a seat at the table and how we think about who controls resources, who has access to them, and are there ways to make the distribution of resources more equitable and democratic. So we're gonna be taking that on next week with an exciting panel of people who, who are really doing innovative work in this space. Um, so I hope you will all join us for that uh, as we keep moving on with this uh, really thought-provoking thought semester. 
And I want to thank Moira for joining us. Uh, Moira, we're gonna we're gonna have to have you come back. Uh, oh, I'd love to. In semesters to come as this continues to evolve. Absolutely, I'd be more than happy to. And again, like I, I welcome comments, questions. Please go visit the website and and send us your information so that we can keep you up updated. Uh, and you know, we're just excited to be doing this work and and looking forward to partnership and collaboration. Um, uh, you know, so thank you again for the opportunity. Great, thank you, and uh, thanks to all who joined us for this. Uh, Totally fascinating conversation. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Thank you.